tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, and every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just sit here at your feet and worship.
just a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to take communion together. So I'm going to, um, you can take what posture you would like this morning. If you'd like to be seated, if you'd like to kneel, if you'd like to come to the altar. If you're listening online at home, we encourage you to grab some elements in your house as we get ready to take this together. If you need elements, just put your hand up and the ushers will come to you. I love that song about asking Jesus to come into the space and to just like consume our life. I don't know about you, but I am a person in need of grace, like on the daily in need of grace. As we take communion this morning, it's this reminder that no matter what we've come in here with, Jesus is enough for us. He can consume everything inside of us. He brings light into the darkness he brings love into the spaces where we feel totally unlovable. He looks at us and he sees value in us. He looks at us despite our mistakes. And let me tell you, all of us could confess our mistakes and the things that we've chosen to do even in the past week that we're not proud of. And he looks at us and he says, I wanna make you new. My grace, it's not just enough, it's more than enough to meet us where we are and, and that, that's something to celebrate. So I want you to take the bread this morning in your cup. And to just acknowledge in these few minutes, just what God has done in your life. Maybe you wanna just take a minute and say thanks. It's kind of this month of thankfulness, although every single day we have something to be thankful for when it comes to our relationship with God. Just take a minute in your heart and your mind. Thank God for what he's done and what he's doing in your life. On the night in which Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, he took this bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This morning, whether you're here or you're listening online, would you take this and eat it and choose to be thankful? Likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks again, he gave it to them and he said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for every single one of us for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. This morning, again, would you drink and be thankful for what Jesus has done? Let's pray together. Jesus, if we were to list out all of the ways that you've blessed us or changed our lives or met us where we are, we wouldn't have enough paper. You're a kind and a compassionate God. And this morning as we worship, we're reminded of just how big your grace is and also how big our need is for you. Father, we ask in these moments as we continue to sing, as we listen to your word, as we go home and spend time with our family and friends, help us to be people who live a life of gratitude, not because of what we've done for ourselves, but because of how you've met us right where we're at. Jesus, we're thankful, we're grateful for your faithfulness and your love and your grace. We love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God. 
know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same.
Father God, thank you so much for being a constant point in our lives. God, whether we feel like we're running at 50% or 100%, God, you remain the same. Thank you for being who you are consistently, God, for allowing us to, to waver in our humanity, God, to allow us to not be perfect, but be perfect when we're with you, God, that, that you complete us. It's more than we can ask for. So thank you for all that you're doing and all that you continue to do. And God, as, as Mark brings your word tonight, God, thank you for giving us ears that can hear for hearts that are willing to change God. And if, if they're not, change that. You're the only one who can change our hearts, who, are, who can open our minds and our ears when we're being stubborn. Thank you. And we love you. Amen. Good morning, Emmanuel Church. We are so glad you joined us today. Whether you're in service or online, we're happy that you are joining us for service. I have a few things to update you guys on, but while I do that, why don't you take out your phone and sign in on the Church Center app? It's really easy. All you have to do is open up the app and hit check in, select what family members are here and at what service, and it's that simple. The first thing as a reminder, our second service will be switching times to 1030 on November 27th. That is the first week of Advent. After discussing for a bit with our staff and our church board, we have decided that for the majority of people, this will make a big difference in shortening the amount of time in between services to better serve our volunteers and people that come for both services. So mark your calendars. November 27th, we will be switching from 1045 to 1030. So make sure if you are a second service attender, you come at that time. This is the first week we are collecting for Operation Christmas Child. If you have your box with you today, you are able to drop that off in the lobby. If you don't have your box with you or you didn't get an opportunity to grab a box yet, you can grab one in the lobby. They have a list of all the things that you would need to fill that box with. So grab that. Take some time this week, fill that box with all the, the goodies that are on the list, and then bring it back next week. Next week, the 13th, will be our last week to collect Operation Christmas Child boxes, so make sure you get yours in next week. This is your reminder to bring in your turkey and ham on November 20th for the Word in Action Turkey and Ham Drive. Their goal is to raise 500 turkeys or hams over this holiday season, whether that be Thanksgiving or Christmas. It will go to a family in need in Philadelphia, and it's just a really great cause. So the next time you're in Giant or in Aldi or wherever you get your groceries, consider picking one up and bringing it in on the 20th. That'll go to a family that could really use it this holiday season. On Friday, December 2nd, we will be holding another evening of worship here at Emmanuel. These are really great nights. We had one a couple weeks ago where we're just able to give everything that we have to God. I think it's a really great way to kind of break the routine that we can sometimes fall into 
and it's just a really great time together. So consider coming out to the evening of worship. That's Friday, December 2nd, and it's here at Emmanuel. It'll be a great time, so why don't you join us? That's it for our announcements, but if you have your tithes or offerings with you here in person today, there are receptacles located at each entrance to the worship center, so you can drop it off there. Or if you wanted to give online, you can do that on the Give tab on our website or on the Church Center app. It's really easy to do. You can give a one-time gift or a recurring gift, and you can decide where your money goes to by selecting the fund when you give, whether that be something like tithes, which helps go to the day-to-day -day operations of the ministry that we do here at Emmanuel, or it could go to something like Global Missions, which would help a missionary around the world. It's all up to you, so if you feel God pulling on your heart today to give, we would greatly appreciate any gifts that you are called to give. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Welcome to week three of Won't You Be My Neighbor? The first week we looked at who is our neighbor and how do we neighbor well. Um, we're focusing on how do we love our neighbors as ourselves. This week I want to talk to you about how far do you go in helping people. I have a dear friend who came to me one day and said that they had just started a new job and the person that they were working with had a severe health crisis and needed a kidney. And so my friend said to me, I think I should give one of my kidneys to them. And I was startled and said to my friend, what, what would make you think that? You don't, you don't even know this person that well. And you've got a family with young children, and is this really the responsible thing to do? And this person said to me, well, I'm thinking that maybe God is talking to me about this, and I have two kidneys, and they need a kidney. And if I gave them a kidney, I'd still have a kidney, and their life would improve dramatically. And I talked him out of it. Was I right or wrong? I don't know. But I talked him out of it. I've been wrestling my whole life with trying to figure out how far do you go in helping people. Holly and I have opened up our home to homeless people and invited them to come in and stay in our home, and we fed them. We've given them food to go on their journey, and our little kids have been sleeping down the hallway, down from the homeless family that we took in. 
Holly and I have given money to people who promised that they would give it back, and we never heard from them again. Were we naive, or were we led by the Spirit? Or maybe a little bit of both. I think every sincere Christian who wants to be a follower of Jesus, somewhere along the way, has to wrestle with the question of how far do you go in helping people? How much is enough? I mean, look at the logic here. If Jesus Christ loves us so much that he died on the cross for our sins, and we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves, if, if you needed a kidney, wouldn't you appreciate it if somebody came to you and said, I have two, you need one, I'll give you one? Wouldn't you want that? Doesn't that mean neighboring well? What does it look like for Emmanuel to neighbor well? I read an article this week about... Um, First Presbyterian Church in Durham, North Carolina, who has asked their congregation to raise $50,000 in order to purchase and forgive medical debt owed by people in their community. I didn't even know that was a thing. That was brand new. Did you know that you could purchase medical debt for pennies on the dollar? So their 50, 000, so this church, First Presbyterian Church, they can purchase $50,000 and for $5 million of medical debt. So this church just decided that the way that they were loving their community was to raise $50,000 so that they could forgive $5 million of people's medical debt. Is, is that what it means for Emmanuel to love our neighbor well? Now, right now, some of you are like, no. While others are like, I never thought about that. Maybe we should take an offering. What does it look like for us to neighbor well? These questions really need Holy Spirit discernment. And so this message today is about how to love our neighbors in a responsible way. Now, here's my default. I think most of us need to go further than what we're actually doing on a regular basis, but not so far that we give harm. And that's the premise of this message. So I'm going to invite you to stand, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and we're going to look at four men who went pretty far in helping their friend who was paralyzed. Mark chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. So the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Yeah. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Would you bow your heads? Holy Spirit, we're trying to figure out how to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. And I think most of us, whether we're in the room or online participating, 
have wrestled at one time or another with this idea of how much should I help? Would you help us today to get a little bit further on in that journey to listen to your spirit to figure that out? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters for his ministry in the Sea of Galilee area. And there is every indication that the home that Jesus was in, whose roof was taken apart, was actually Jesus' house. Did you know that? Either Jesus was given that house for the period of time in his public ministry there, or he was renting it. But most Bible scholars believe it was actually Jesus' house. The four men had a friend that they cared for very deeply, and when they heard that Jesus was back in town, they decided to bring their friend to Jesus. Now, houses back then were built of stone, like many houses today, but they were usually one story, which means that they, almost every house had a set of stairs going up the side of the house in order to get to the roof. In those days... It was so hot, just like it is today in, in, in the Sea of Galilee area and in Jerusalem, all of Israel. You know, you don't want to be in Israel in June, July, and August because it's regularly about 105, 110 degrees. It's just sweltering hot. So what people would do is, is that early in the morning or late at night, they would climb up the side steps and they'd get on the roof of their house. And that's where they'd have dinner. That's where they'd do a lot of living just because it was a lot cooler up there. I want you to think about how far these four men went in helping their paralyzed friend. Number one, they disrupted a public gathering. I mean, there's a lot of people, right? Don't discount this. There's a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of people here today. Imagine if suddenly light was beginning to shine through of our roof and you begin to hear all these kinds of things going on and all of a sudden everybody's just like looking up. What's happening? Whoa, look out for that. Second, they risked appearing too extreme. Today, we might use the phrase, who does that? Who does that? That's kind of crazy. They're extreme. Why didn't they just wait until Jesus was finished teaching? Notice also they destroyed somebody else's personal property. And they would be responsible to pick up the cost. Now, if there's any insurance agents here, you could just imagine, you, you know, you're sitting there and you're watching this, this roof being taken apart and you've got your calculator out. Mm -mm -mm. Do they have homeowners? Who's responsible for all this? They are. They're going to have to put the roof back together. But their faith paid off because not only did their friend receive a healing so that he could walk again, but his sins were forgiven. And revival broke out. And people were shouting and giving praise to God. And they were saying, we've never seen anything like this before. So what is this passage of Scripture, this, this beautiful story, and some other passages of Scripture in the Bible, what does it have to say to us about how far do we go in helping people? And how do we help people responsibly? Five thoughts. Number one, I think if you're going to love your neighbor responsibly, I think you need to be prepared to be uncomfortable. Matthew 14, 29 says, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Have you discovered in your own Christian journey that every once in a while, God calls you to get out of the boat? What I mean by that is to get out of your comfort zone. We all have this comfort zone that we're in and every once in a while, the Lord Jesus Christ touches our heart. There's a need in front of us. God kind of nudges us to say, hey, I want you to go and do that. I want you to go and say that. And our immediate response is, no, 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 not doing that. No. Well, you just need to be prepared if you're going to help people in a responsible way to get uncomfortable. I think if I was one of the men there, I would have been uncomfortable helping my friend as well. I've already mentioned about the temperature. You know, have you ever carried a heavy weight a long distance in 100-degree weather? You get a little sweaty, don't you? And imagine the fact of how it was to navigate up the side stairs getting up to the roof. We talk about the faith of these four men, like they had great faith, and they did, that Jesus would heal their friend. But imagine being on the mat, and you're being carried up the stairs. You're looking over the edge like... 
you guys got me, right? Because I'm going to be in worse shape if you guys drop me. You know what I mean? It took real effort to tear a large section of the roof off and to lower, man, lower the man down in front of Jesus. What would have made me uncomfortable, to be honest with you, is that all of these eyes are on me as I'm navigating, bringing this man down in front of Jesus. Helping people typically means getting out of your comfort zone. You know, the first time I went to a prison to serve in prison ministry, I felt pretty uncomfortable. The first time I took a work and witness trip to Kenya, I felt pretty uncomfortable. We had just gotten off the plane, then we had drove about two and a half hours to get to our children's home in, in, in Boney, and um, we got off of the van, all of us are exhausted, we hadn't slept in 30 hours, and the head of the children's home looks at me and says, Pastor Mark, give us a devotional. And I was like, uh, I don't know, I don't even know where my Bible is. That's okay, give us a word from the Lord. And I stood up for 20 minutes and just started giving a devotional. And the whole time I'm thinking, am I making this up? Am I really asleep? <laughs> it was just a little uncomfortable for me. Can I tell you, to this day, when I stand up and preach, I get butterflies in my stomach. I just do. Loving your neighbor as yourself, for most of us, means pushing past your awkward feelings and doing the opposite of what you really feel like doing. Number two, count the cost before you help. Luke, 24, Luke 14, 28 says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Just like you need to count the cost if you're going into a construction project in your home to figure out if you really have the resources, the funding, you know, all that to make sure that the project is completed, we need to do the same thing when it comes to helping other people. The four men who carried their friend to Jesus did not act spontaneously, even though it may look like they did. They actually had a plan. And then when they got to the house, after carrying this man, who knows how far, and they realized that they could not get into the house. They improvised, made another plan, went up the side steps, and began to dismantle the roof because they were determined that their plan was going to succeed. Sometimes our desire to help, to be honest, is a knee-jerk reaction to an emotional response. We hear a heartfelt story, and we say to ourselves, oh, I want to help, and then we sign up. Or then we promise to do something and then a day later, we realize you don't have the time, you don't have the resources, you don't have the skill set to do any of the things that you just signed up for, and you're like, mm, boy, I don't know if I should have done that. Helping people in a responsible way usually means praying about it, thinking it through, looking at your calendar, looking at your finances, talking to your family to see if you can actually follow through with your help. Number three. I think we need to help people with the goal of them not needing our help anymore. The four friends wanted to help their friend get to the place where he could walk, where he could work again, when he could where he could function independently. Can I just be honest and say that so much of our helping actually says more about us than it does about the other person. We want to help somebody because it fills a need in our own life, and we actually end up overhelping people because we're getting something back from it rather than actually helping that person get to a place where they don't need any help anymore. Notice 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. And now, dear brothers and sisters, stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition that they have received from us. We never accepted fruit from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. What? That sounds really harsh. What's going on? 
Did you know that First and Second Thessalonians were the earliest of Paul's letters? And there was a general assumption in the early church that Jesus was going to return in the same generation that he left. So when Jesus promised that he would return, everybody in the early church thought 10 years, 20 years maybe, maybe 30. No one expected Jesus to not return in the same generation. And so when Paul is writing his letter to the church in Thessalonica, they're all, all of us, you know, they're all newly believers, you know what I'm saying? And so what happened in Thessalonica was something a little bit unique, but we see it happen sometimes in human history, and there's lots of documentation of this, is that when people think that the Lord is coming back, they get crazy. They quit their jobs. They run up their credit cards. They sell their homes. And they were like, well, Jesus is going to return in the next uh, couple weeks or next couple years. What do I have to worry about? And here's what was happening in Thessalonica. People quit their jobs, weren't working, and they were sponging off of other people. Hey, it's Tuesday. Can I come over to your house? You're serving this pasta night, right? Wednesday, steak tips. All right, see you next Wednesday. And, you know, I mean, people were loving, kind, and gracious in Thessalonica, but, you know, there would begin to this, like, I don't know, I think Bobby needs to get a job. I mean, I know the Lord may be coming, but I'm running a little bit low on pasta. So you know what Paul says? Paul writes the ship. And Paul says, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. And that righted the ship to become more responsible in people's behavior. Your goal should be to help people until they are able to help themselves. And once they're able to help themselves, you take a sanctified step back and you just go, way to go. That's your goal. Number four, this is a sticky one. Be aware that overhelping can actually hurt. Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 5, actually that whole section, 2 through 5, I've just, for the purposes of, of just clarity, I've just taken verse 2 and verse 5, but the whole section talks about a little contradictory item. Verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. That's pretty obvious, right? Is that we ought to be burden bearers. If you've got a burden, I ought to carry your burden because carrying your burden is going to make your burden a lot lighter. But oddly, in verse 5, the apostle, goes on, apostle Paul goes on to say, for each of you should carry their own load. Okay, what does that mean? I mean, on the one hand, we're supposed to carry each other's burdens. On the other hand, we're not supposed to carry... We're supposed to just carry our own load. The difference lies in what the two words mean. The Greek word for burden in verse 2 refers to a weight of eternal significance. Now, it could be a character flaw. It could be a sin that weighs you down. It could be a particular struggle that you're going through. It could be that one of your kids is going through a really hard time and you don't know what to do. And so we're supposed to carry each other's burdens in that sense. So that's why we have prayer requests, right? Can you pray for me? Because my kid's not prospering right now. Hey, you know what? That's why James says that we ought to confess our sins one to another, is that by confessing our sins one to another by a trusted brother or a trusted sister in Christ, is that... We're only as sick as our secrets. And if we unburden ourselves and say to someone, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Maybe, I, maybe you don't think I, I should be struggling with this, but I am. And if that other person begins to pray with you, it makes your load lighter. Those are the kind of burdens we're supposed to carry. But what about loads? The Greek word for load in verse 5 re refers to the responsibilities that are unique to us and must be carried by us alone. Do you see the difference between a burden and a load? There are some things you're not meant to carry alone, and there are many things you're supposed to carry alone. For example, I, I have a responsibility as a husband, as a dad, as a grandfather, as a pastor. I have a responsibility for my own personal journey of holiness that I'm still trying to work out. You can't bear that burden for me. 
You can't be a dad for me. Only I can be a dad to my, my kids. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's a difference between burden and load. Now here's the kicker. We hurt ourselves and others when we don't know the difference between a burden and a load. Or to say it another way, when we take responsibilities for the load of others that we were never intended to take. This plays out in two ways. The first is where overhelping can actually hurt you. Have you ever been on a plane and heard the familiar words, if the oxygen mask drops, put it on yourself before you help anybody else? Why is that? Because if you go unconscious, somebody's going to have to help you. This is the secret behind loving your neighbor as yourself. We are to love ourselves in the sense of practicing good self-care. Now, the challenge behind self-care is this. It feels a lot like selfishness. In fact, sometimes it feels exactly the same. But you're going to have to determine in your mind when you're being selfish and when you're simply practicing good self-care. Jesus does not want you to ruin your health by helping other people because one day somebody else is going to have to help you out because you ruined your help, health helping other people. Does that make sense? So we need to practice this sanctified balance and we need discernment of the Holy Spirit to help us to figure out what's a burden and what's a load. Overhelping can also hurt your primary responsibility, which is your family. Some people have hurt their marriages and children by helping others, but neglecting the most important gifts that God has given them, and that is your spouse and your children. The parable of the Good Samaritan is so profound because it's a model of what it means to neighbor responsibly. The Samaritan did all he could do for the badly beaten up man. He put him on his own donkey. He took him to an inn. He stayed up all night with him until he saw that he turned the corner and was going to make it. And then what happened the next day? He got on his donkey and left the man at the inn. Why didn't he stay with the man who had been beaten up badly all the way until the man could go home? Simply this. The good Samaritan wasn't needed anymore. He handed him off to somebody else who could take care of him. Let me get back again to this one little idea. Sometimes helping somebody else fills a need inside of us that we actually end up overhelping because we want to have those warm, fuzzy feelings. But overhelping can actually hurt the person by making them more dependent on you than what they should be. Last thought, we help people most by bringing them to Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 4. Then they lowered the man on his mat right in front of Jesus. What does it mean to bring people to Jesus? Well, sometimes it means just sharing Jesus with them and inviting them into a relationship. But most of the time, I think it really means praying for people. I think we discount prayer. Right? We, we're like, well, you know, what can I do for you beyond praying for you? Because we want to be so practical. But the reality is, is that some of the best things that we could possibly do is to help other people by praying for them because we bring the resources of heaven to them in a way that wasn't before. James 5.16 says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay, I want to take a hard right. I'm at the end of the message. I just want to take a hard right and bring up something. Why do some people don't help others in a meaningful way? I think a lot of people have stopped really helping people. I mean, they'll nominally help people. But I mean, they've stopped really, really going pretty far in helping people because somewhere in their past they've been hurt and taken advantage of. You help somebody out, and they did you wrong. You really sacrificed, and they didn't send you a thank you note. 
You really went on a limb to get somebody a job? And then they turned around and messed you over. And secretly on the inside, we say to ourselves, well, I'm never doing that again. A little secret about this message, this passage of Scripture has nothing to do with what I've been talking about today. This passage of Scripture is actually not really about helping people in a responsible way. It's actually about something else completely. The most important verses in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, is this phrase. The Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. That's what this story is about. Now here's what's interesting. When Jesus forgave the man's sins and healed the paralyzed man, he was giving a foreshadow to the cross and the resurrection. And just as those men created a space to lower their friend down in front of Jesus, Jesus created a space in your heart and my heart to receive forgiveness and to receive healing. Just like the man. And here's what I think. I think some of you need to receive a healing today from the wounded, uh, woundedness that you got some time ago because you were trying to help somebody out, and it didn't go that well. Would you consider taking Colossians 3.13 to heart? Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anybody who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. This passage of Scripture is actually all about forgiveness and living a clean life before God. So that whatever you do for other people, it's always done in the name of Jesus. So that when you experience a hurt or taken advantage of, you can let it roll off your back. It may take a while, but you can let it roll off your back and say, you know what? I'm going to make allowances for their sins because God made a space in my heart to receive forgiveness for my own sins. So here's my question I want to leave with you. Who needs your help this week in a very practical way? Who needs your help this week? And how can you help that person in a responsible way? And is there anything keeping you from really loving your neighbor as yourself? Is there anything in your past that has just hung you up? And I'm asking you today, would you consider just letting that go? I don't know whether, whether it was right or not to um, have some homeless people stay with Holly and I when our kids were just down the hallway. I don't know whether it was right or not to give money to people who's promised they'd give it back, but they never did. But I've let go of those things. I just let them go. And that doesn't stop me at all from helping people in the future. Live free. That little thorn in your heart that has kept you from really loving people because of that hurt, maybe it was a divorce. That's a big thing, right? Maybe it was a, a friend stabbing you in the back. Just let it go. Why? Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anybody who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. And you must forgive others. Allow the Lord to open up a space in your own heart today so that you can love your neighbor as yourself freely and without reserve, being led by the Holy Spirit to do whatever God wants you to do. Let's stand. Holy Spirit, I, I just have this, I just have this nudge. I'm, I'm hoping it's from you. But I just have this nudge that you want to invite some people to let go and to forgive. I don't know what that means for them. 
but I think you're speaking to some folks about that very thing. So, in this quiet moment, if you want to let go of a past hurt that you've been taken advantage of, that you know is still hovering over you right now, why don't you just take a step out in the aisle and say, I'm releasing it to you today and I'm letting it go. It's just that simple. Take a step out in the aisle and say, yep, I'm letting it go. Okay, people are moving. Go ahead, take a leap. Allow the Lord to create space inside of you to lower forgiveness because he has the authority to do exactly that. Holy Spirit, thank you for nudging people. Right now, as people release whatever their pain and hurt is to you, set them free and give them a heart to love people like they would want to be loved. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.
we thank you for changing our lives and for just doing things that we can't even fathom. There are so many things that, that people say or people do, things that we hold on to, but you can change our hearts and we thank you for that. We ask you to just stay with us through the hard times, through the easy times. We just thank you for being who you are. We love you. Amen. Thanks for being here today, and we'll see you next week.